politics is a religion. It's not something where people are shopping around saying, oh, what's the most reasonable view of the situation? Rather, it's one where people have these core ideas that give meaning to their lives, and then they just talk as if they've got it all figured out, no matter how little they really know. Yeah. Hello, welcome again to another episode in the Let People Prosper series. My name is Dr. Vance Gann. I hope you're having a prosperous day. Well, today I'm delighted to have on another guest who's been fighting for freedom, fighting for more kids, and, and also maybe closing down some schools, you know, really uh, making sure that we have better education across America. And it's none other than Dr. Brian Kaplan. Brian, welcome to Let People Prosper show. Thank you very much for having me. Well, it's a pleasure. It really is. And we've got a lot to talk about. You're always hitting on some key things that might strike the nerve, if I might say trigger some people. So if you're if you're getting excited or you don't want to get triggered, you might not want to listen to this episode, but I think you do. So let's get right to it. Here is a quick bio of Brian. Brian is a professor of economics at George Mason University and New York Times bestselling author. He's written The Myth of the Rational Voter, named the best political book of the year by the New York Times. He's written Selfish Reasons to Have More Kids. He's also written The Case Against Education, another book, Open Borders. I mean, there's just a number of them that are out there that we're going to cover on a lot of these issues here today. He is the editor and chief writer for Bet On It, the blog hosted by the Salem Center for Public Policy at the University of Texas. He's published at many top outlets and appear on many top radio and TV shows. He is an openly, what he says, nerdy man who loves role-playing games and graphic novels and lives in Oakton, Virginia with his wife and four kids. That's a great bio there, Brian. So with all that said, let's start off with why do you do what you do every day? I think the honest answer is a combination of fun and pride. I really like doing stuff, being active, getting things done. I like having a lot of balls to juggle. I like talking to people, especially during COVID. I really came to terms with, oh, I really am unhappy if I'm not interacting with people. And then there's the pride when I feel like, ah, I don't feel like doing it. It's like, but I can't just sit around here. I feel like <laughs> I've got to get things done. Like, I can't look in the mirror like this. How could I be the father of my kids if I'm a lazy <laughs> bum? So that's the kick in the pants that gets me working when I actually feel unmotivated. Well, yeah, uh, that's great. That's great. Well, how, how did you get to where you are? I mean, there, you know, you, you have these kids, you have, you're George Mason now. What were some of the big institutional changes in your life that got you where you are today? Well, I have this book in education, and what I'll tell you is I have one of the most credentialous jobs in the universe. You know, there is an exact path that you must take to become a university professor, and I followed that path. Yeah. I was a good student in school. I was never a content student. I was never someone who was like, oh, goody, I get to be in school. And said, <laughs> right, what exactly do I have to do to game this crummy system? If I happen to have a really good teacher, I appreciated that, but I didn't consider most of my education to be worthwhile. But I said, well, how can I actually get paid to go and do what I want to do? And I found out, wow, professors get that deal. Like, how do you get it? Well, it's a giant pain in the neck, and there's a whole bunch of hurdles you have to get through. So I got my undergraduate degree at Berkeley, got my PhD at Princeton. And then through the power of Tyler Cowan, I was able to get the job that I currently have. I had met him before starting graduate school, and he really helped me to get the job that I now have. And then once I had that job, it's a question of, well, the first is like, well, how do I keep this job? It's yeah. an incredible opportunity. So I started off just publishing things in order to get tenure. But once I felt like I was reasonably secure, that's where I said, okay, now finally I'm ready to start doing the work that I want. Yeah. I want to go and work on questions that I consider big and important. I don't want to just go and chip away at some small issue. I want to deal with the big questions. And each of my books does try to go and tackle what I see as a big question. Yeah. Well, you've definitely done that. <laughs> so I'm looking Thanks. forward to Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, that, that's great. And before we get going in too far into that, what are some of your assumptions? You know, I've had folks on Peter Betke and, and others where they're more of the Austrian school of economics. I've had others who are more of the, the Chicago school and John Cochran, who talks about the theory, fiscal theory, the price level. What about, what about you, Brian? What are kind of your assumptions as you go in to look at the world on how you, how you see it? There's the really obvious stuff like, Appearances are revealing. You look at the world and it shows you how it really is. Yeah. And now there's a bunch of problems with that. Like, are you only looking at a particular corner of the world? Is it really a genuine random sample? But still, you just think about how dogmatic most intellectuals are, how incurious they are about the world. 
just saying, well, what's going on? I want to find out. That's a big part of it. Yeah. So you know, curiosity, that's a very big part of how I look at the world. Say, so, like, I wonder what in the world is going on here. What like someone must have thought about these questions. What do they say? There's the assumption that that people who have thought about things for a long time actually have something useful to say, usually, unless they are so caught up in their dogmas that mm-hmm. they aren't really talking about the world at all. They're only talking about what other people have talked about, whatever whatever people have talked about. In terms of other assumptions, let's see, actions speak louder than words. That's yeah. a huge one for me. People will often say things that don't make a lot of sense. And when they do, look at their behavior and you will discover what they actually think. Mm-hmm. If someone says, I know who's going to win the election for sure. And you say, fine, bet me a 10 to 1 odds. And they say, no, I won't. It's like, well, it doesn't seem like that. That doesn't seem like the action of a person who's sure. Yeah. It sounds like the action of a fraud who pretends to have a crystal ball that you don't really have. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. Great point. Well, wh- why don't we start there with your book, The Myth of the Rational Voter? Why do you consider it a, a myth? What, what's going on there? Because usually, you know, we hear a lot of politicians and I talk to a lot of politicians. They're like, oh, we're trying to help out the, the rational voter. We're ha- the average person. We're trying to help them out. But what is this idea of the myth of rational vo- voter? I mean, I would say the best way that you see the rational voter assumption in politics is just when a politician says, the American people think this, the American yeah. people want that with the tone of, of course, they are correct, and it, this couldn't possibly be challenged. It can't be that they're just mistaken. In social science, this idea takes on a much more egregious form because there are actually economists, political scientists, people like that, who really look at the world and say, we can all, we have to assume that the typical person is right hmm. and then figure out what story makes sense given that assumption. What I do in this book is say, like, well, why that assumption? It doesn't yeah. seem true. Isn't it's possible that most people are wrong about something? You know, there's this old saying, can't 40 million Frenchmen be wrong? <laughs> yeah. You know, this is pretty obvious for straightforward questions like, give me the breakdown of the budget, and you'll just see that most people have crazy beliefs about where we spend money. But then if you are, for example, just to take a random thing, an economics professor, yeah. <laughs> you look at what students think about how economics works compared to what thoughtful people think, what they think is just silly. Mm-hmm. It is a, just a normal thing for a person to say, if workers aren't paid enough, pass a law saying they have to be paid a good amount and that solves the problem. Like, well, wait a second. Doesn't that mean that fewer people will be hired? Doesn't that mean that more people want to work? So aren't you causing unemployment with this job or with this policy rather? Isn't yeah. that itself a problem? It's like, though, that's just ideology. Like, no, your thing is ideology. Mine is common sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's great. I wonder, given the situation that we're in, and, and, and you know, I, I worked for a year in the Trump administration, for better or worse. Mm-hmm. I, I learned a lot. I don't know if I'd do it again. I, I probably would not do it. Yeah. But yeah. I, I was the chief economist for the Office of Management and Budget. And the president looked a lot at polls. And we see that yeah. more and more now of uh, populism on the rise. And I'm a classical liberal, Brian. Like, I, I wasn't into all that. I was trying to go a different direction on a lot of things. But we see that so much in politics now, from the left and the right. It, it, yeah. it, it's both. And and I, I wonder how this feeds into some of your work that you've done in this area. The only thing I disagree with is that word now that you put at the end. Okay. (laughs) You can just delete it. (laughs) This is the way that it's always been. You can say polling has gotten more advanced, but show me the country where politicians care more about objective reality than people's beliefs about objective reality. Even most dictators care what public opinion thinks. That's why they pander. It's why they demagogue because they're like, well, it's going to be pretty hard to be the dictator if everyone in this whole country hates me. I could yeah. go and like, just kill everybody that looks at me the wrong way, but that sort of puts me in a precarious position. So yeah. all politicians practically are quite concerned about public opinion. And then the question is, well, how does public opinion about politics form? In the myth of the rational voter, I say really the best analogy is politics is a religion. It's not something where people are shopping around saying, oh, what's the most reasonable view of the situation? Rather, it's one where people have these core ideas that give meaning to their lives, and then they just talk as if they've got it all figured out, no matter how little they really know. It's something else, because you hear that from so many, and, and it, it may not even be the politician, uh, <laughs> maybe the Department of, of, of Agencies and everyone else, you know? So, I mean, like, when you talk to people in politics, yep. do they go and say, yeah, politics is a religion? 
religion. People are ridiculous. No, they they, yeah. they, they, they feel like they really know what the people yes, want. Yes. Ah, so they are religious. Not that they yeah. say, yeah, I'm a dogmatic fool here, but rather it's like, these are off sacred beliefs. Yes. Anyone yes. who questions them, let they be, let them be anathema, anathema, anathema. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And it's unfortunate, right? Because then we see all this expansion of government and the national debt and everything else, because now we need to hand out goodies. You need to have tax cuts on one side and expenditures on the other side. And don't worry about if, if what the debt and what that means later on. I guess if you're a modern monetary theorist or something, you think yeah. it didn't have any problem and it might actually help you. But we know that's nonsense, yeah. <laughs> that there are real costs because nothing is free. It really does look like the U.S. is heading for fiscal crisis. It yeah. could have been so much better if we just gotten started earlier. But both sides want to say, well, look, we're just going to spend money and hope things work out. Cross our fingers. Someone else will have to deal with this problem. Yeah. I was recently just thinking about how in the mid-90s, there was a very technical proposal hmm. that could easily have solved all these problems if we had just followed it. There was something called the Boskin Commission where they said, you know, looks like our official measure of inflation is about one percentage point too high every year. If we And if we would just go and redefine it, this would mean that all cost of living adjustments will be one percentage point per year compounded smaller. Yep. And if you go back and redo the math, you'll discover, gee, if we had actually listened to them, we would be in a fantastic physical, physical situation right now. And yeah. it would barely have been noticed. It just yeah. slightly chipped away at the problem every year for about 30 years, leaving us in, leaving, honestly, leaving us on easy straight. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. But people didn't listen. And the intellectual case for the Boston Commission position, I think, was ironclad. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that's a great point. There's so many of those things. There's small little tweaks here and there could get us in a much better situation later on and today. Today, even. And so. in your job, did anyone talk about CPI bias or the boss? Yeah, yeah. There were, not, not so much of the commission, but there was yeah. the CPI bias. There was talk about the poverty rates, uh, the official poverty measure, the problems with it, moving more towards a consumption based poverty measure instead. Yeah. There were some of these discussions that were going on. Yeah, the absurdity of justifying poverty programs because poverty is severe, and then refusing to count the money you spend on poverty right. programs yeah. in the income of uh, in the income of the poor. It's like, well, wait a second. Seems like you are just determined to make the problem be permanent by yeah. refusing to even count your own programs as having solved anything. Yeah, that's right. It, <laughs> one caveat years. there, though, is that if you do include it, like the supplemental poverty measure does include those transfer mm -hmm. payments and everything, there, there is an argument then that you could just expand those transfer payments more to bring down poverty, which then means it's a drain on the private sector. So we have to be careful <laughs> about how much money we're spending, because I think ultimately the war on poverty has been a, a total failure because of how much money we've had to pull out of the private sector. We want a flourishing private economy with people having jobs and everything else, sure. not sitting by um, getting these handouts in the process. It is an interesting question. What is it that motivates people to expand the welfare state? Is it the perception that the welfare state has worked and we should do more? Mm -hmm. Or the perception that problems are terrible and we barely done anything and how we have to really commit ourselves? Yeah. Just based upon every activist, I would say that what they think anyway is that you have to keep make people think that the world is terrible, otherwise they won't spend anything. Yeah. No, I think that they're and I think they're probably right. I'm not sure about this. One thing that strikes me is I've talked to friends in Sweden. I say, so what does the left say in Sweden? Do they say our system is great and we're the model for the world, the third way? Or do they say that we have a horrible, oppressive capitalist system and our poor are suffering? Hmm. And my Swedish friends say, yeah, the left in Sweden says the second thing, just like they do in other countries. They don't <laughs> go and do a victory lap and say, you know, Sweden has a solved a problem of a poverty if only all the countries were unlike us. Instead, what they say is, we have done a next to a nothing to solve Oh, there are problems. Yeah. So there's something about the activists where they, I think they correctly sense that they just can't get more of what they want without saying the sky is falling. Yeah. Actually speaking, it could go the other way, but I think that it is actually for the best just to calm people down and say the problem is no longer very severe. Yeah. 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 That's a great point. It makes me think too about how I'm um, going back to the rational mm -hmm. voters and how politicians are rational, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they have a different set of marginal costs and marginal benefits, but they also need, need to win re-election. Mm -hmm. So they know that if they give them more of those goodies, more of the transfer payments and safety net programs, that more of those people are going to be more likely to vote for them. So, so why wouldn't they want to? Yeah, we, what I say in my book is that politicians are very rational about yep. what the public wants. There, it is dangerous to have big illusions. Hmm. But yes, in terms of the effects of programs, on the other hand, that's where it's pretty safe to be oblivious. Yeah. 
I don't think that the story of people vote for stuff because they want goodies for themselves really actually predicts very much. Okay. But, you know, rather, what you see is that people like government spending not so much for themselves, but because they think it's best for society. Hmm. You know, so it's not like rich people say, I don't favor government spending on healthcare because I'm not going to benefit from it. And so the normal view of rich and poor alike is we've got to do more about healthcare. Yeah. Normal view for poverty you know, or, like, or for crime is not that we've got to go and spend money to help me personally, but rather it's what kind of a human being would I be if I was against spending money on disabled veterans or whatever. Mm. Never mm. mind, like how much money do we spend on them? Do they, have we actually already dealt with the problem sufficiently? Yeah. You know, a psychologically normal person in politics, it's not a time to go and grab stuff for themselves. It's not a good way to do that. You'd be better off working overtime than voting if you just want more money for yourself. But uh, rather, it is a time for people to express their devotion to their secular religion. And mm. that's what I think is going on. It's like a church. Yep. Well, speaking of how much money we spend on things by government, uh, taxpayer money, that is education. So you've got this book, The Case Against Education. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I've read it. I, I, I like a lot of it in there. And uh, but I'd love to hear you explain kind of your highlight, your, your sales pitch to folks. Main thing that I say in this book is I start with a puzzle something that is strange in the world. Namely, we spend all this time in school. The main motive apparently is to get a better job. And yet most of what you learn in school doesn't seem relevant in the real world. So how is that possible? There is a standard propaganda story that we go to school to get to learn useful skills, and then we go out in the real world and we use those skills. But if you're paying attention, that only describes a modest fraction of what you're doing in school. So what else could possibly be going on? And there I appeal to what economists call the signaling model of education that says that even if you are studying subjects that are irrelevant in the real world, it can still impress employers. It can still certify you. You get a stamp on your forehead. I went and was able to get through all this difficult and boring schoolwork. I got good grades. I finished on time. Therefore, don't throw my application away. What is striking? So I don't claim in this book to have any theoretical originality in coming up with a signaling model. It basically was developed right around the time that I was born. Mm. But what's different about me is that unlike almost everybody who works on this, I don't just take it as a fun, little, a fun cute little theory. Mm -hmm. See, this is the theory that explains the real world of education as it actually exists. Why? Well, if you take a look at what's in the curriculum, most of the stuff that you learn is actually just not relevant in real life. Mm. You don't actually need history or foreign language or even higher mathematics in order to do almost any even high paying job in the US. But you do need that degree in order to get your foot in the door to, uh, to be able to get the real training. Mm. And a way that I like, often like to describe it is that people like to think of education as being job training, but it, in the reality it is a passport to the real training, which happens on the job. Mm. From the point of view of a selfish individual, like almost all of us are, mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter why education helps you. You just need to know that it does. But from the point of view of policy, it matters tremendously. Because if the usual view of education as creating skills is true, then education is a way to enrich your society. We all get more school. We all have more skill. We all are richer. On the other hand, if my story is correct, this is what, the, what really happens. You spend more in school. We all get more stamps on our forehead. And then employers raise their standards about how many stamps you need in order to not have your application be thrown in the trash. We get what we call credential inflation, where you need more degrees just to get, to get the same job your parents or grandparents were able to get with less. Hmm. So that's, that's my big story. Yeah. In terms of what it means for policy, it's real simple. First and foremost, Stop spending on education. Cut, yeah. cut, cut educational austerity. We are wasting piles of money. Stop trying to increase accessibility. Stop trying to increase affordability. Instead, think of it as something that is a waste of taxpayer money, and we need to have a whole lot less. Yeah, There's a lot of ways we could have less, and when people are, are ready to go and say, how should we cut? That's where I say, I love that question. Yeah. Hardly anyone has spent any time thinking about the best ways to spend less on education. So let's just try it all. Yeah, no, great point. Yeah, that's the first place you just start. Where do we cut spending? <laughs> not, not how much right. should it grow? Usually we have budget inertia. Take yeah, how much we spent last time, just yeah. increase it. And yeah, just like go through the curriculum and say, what's a waste of time? What do people yeah. not really need to know? Go yeah. through academic departments, which departments are bogus and do not provide useful skills in the real world. 
And you know, do that sort of you know, but also like, how many people are we keeping in school where they just aren't interested in mm. this material and barely learn anything? Yep. Is there something else they could be doing like getting a job and mm-hmm. learning real skills sooner? Now, about that? now would you um, break this down for the K through 12 and higher ed? Or are you mainly focused on the higher ed portion? Most people keep assuming I'm only talking about higher ed. Yeah, see, There's I didn't think people so. many people who just keep misstating the title of the book. It's the case against hi- higher education. Like, mm-hmm. Higher is not in the title. Nope. Um, in the book, I primarily talk about grades nine up. Yeah. First of all, because that's the only, that's pretty much the only stuff we have variation on. So it's hard to really know what's going on otherwise. But it's also right around the level where the daycare function of education ceases to be important. Mm-hmm. So yep. all the other stuff, as we learned during COVID, you can be learning nothing in school, and yet it still has a, you know, the schools are providing a useful service as long as it's in person, mm-hmm. namely daycare, so parents can go and do their jobs. Once you are at the high school level, that's right, say, you could be doing a job, you could be doing an apprenticeship, you don't need to be, uh, have your hand held and be monitored and when, when you cross the street or whatever. But, you know, but honestly, I'd say I've never seen any kind of education where it didn't seem like they're wasting a lot of students' time. Even in kindergarten, I take a look and said, you know, it's a lot of the stuff that isn't really fun for most of the kids. They don't need to know it in real life. So why don't you just go and let them play on the playground for mm-hmm. their spare time? You know, I think it's great to go and teach kids reading, writing, literacy. But after you're doing that, if the kid doesn't want to go and learn something else. They're not interested. We have a lot of evidence that they won't even remember it. So mm-hmm. why torture the poor child? Why not say we've done our actual time where we've given useful skills? Now go play. Yeah. Well, yeah. alternately, how about you can go study in the library if you are, if you don't like sports? I do that instead. When, when we're thinking about you know government schools, public mm-hmm. schools, what they call them, is that there's some sort of positive externality, right? Like mm-hmm. the innocent bystanders are also going to benefit from these people who are getting educated. And this is the long story about how well, the reason why government should be involved that it's in most constitutions. Like I'm in Texas. I live near Austin, Texas. It's in the constitution that says that the Texas legislature shall adequately and efficiently fund public, what they call public free schools. Now, I don't think that necessarily means just uh-huh. government schools, but that's what a lot of people interpret from it. Um, and well, so how maybe- about efi- How about that efficient part? Doesn't that mean they have right. to just, uh, take exactly. a bulldozer to what they've got? Sorry, it wasn't efficient. Yeah, exactly. And so t- t- to me, whenever I'm looking at this stuff, I don't even see that it's a, a positive externality anymore. Mm-hmm. Where's the benefit that we're seeing as as, as, as grades continue to go down, screw the, these test scores, however they do want to do it, are going down over time, yet we keep spending more and more. Where's the, where's the ROI? Where's the return on what we're doing here if that's really the path to go. And now I don't know where you're at on this, Brian, but like I'm at least in favor of school choice because I don't see that the states are going to end it uh, and get it out of the constitution. I'd be for that. Don't get me wrong if they wanted to do that. But if we're going to provide this uh, as taxpayers and everything else, why not have you know at least school choice through education savings accounts or something else? But I wonder, given your background and, and your, your work on this, um, wh- what do you say about that? So first of all, I think we should be super open-minded about positive externalities of education and okay. say, all right, maybe let's take a look. Yeah. We should also be really open-minded about negative externalities of education. Mm-hmm. The signaling story we're talking about is essentially a story of negative externalities of education. It says yeah. that a lot of what you do in school is make yourself look better by getting extra stamps in your forehead, which correspondingly makes everyone else look worse. That's the heart of it. And without increasing the productivity of the workforce, or at least not increasing it very much. So that's the main thing I say. Like, let's be open-minded. Let's be open-minded on both ends. So I say that We have very strong evidence of a very harsh negative externality of education, that credential inflation that I'm talking about, that's Mm -hmm. the negative externality. In terms of other positive externalities, I go through them in my book as well. The only one that I think actually winds up being really big is that there seems to be pretty good evidence that sending people to school for more years reduces their criminality, which has Mm. a lot of social costs. Uh, However, there it looks like, once again, that's mostly relative amounts of education. So back when the general population had a lot less education, it's uh, then criminality was actually lower. So I say, even that one's not that clear. But anyway, Mm. if you add them all up, I say that there's just very little doubt that the net net externality of education is highly negative. Yeah rather than positive, as people generally assume. Yep. In terms of school choice, I will say that when I was writing the case, case against education, a lot of my mind was, look, philosophically, I like this idea of school choice, but it looks to me like private schools basically are about as crummy in terms of teaching skills as public schools. Mm. COVID actually changed my mind on that because guess what? The What, what we learned during COVID is the most undeniably useful thing schools do is it provide daycare. Mm. And public schools around the country were highly inclined to just stop providing 
providing any daycare, do Zoom school for years if need be, and private schools, in stark contrast, almost universally reopened the day it was legal. Right. So I know in Texas, actually, your schools reopened sooner, but I was in yeah. Northern Virginia. Our schools were Zoom for over a year. That's rough. So yeah. Not e not even daycare, as I was saying. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, yeah. So that was something where I realized, no, there is actually a big difference in terms of response. This has got to be something that the customers want. Mm -hmm. If you know, so if customers think that it's great to teach kids Latin, schools will keep teaching kids Latin. Yeah. Like like why? Mm -hmm. Well, um, because we always done it, we, we've always done it that way. So we're going to keep doing it. All right. Well, like you know, school choice will not solve problems if the parents themselves are committed, nor will it solve the problems if parents are just zombies who listen mm -hmm. to whatever educators tell them and believe it. In the case of reopening the schools, this is something where parents definitely had a strong preference. And even if teachers didn't like it, like, I do not want my kid to be hanging around all day. I can't do yeah. my job. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, we were actually in uh, McLean, Virginia, whenever ah. all the when all the lockdowns started happening, and so soon after that was like, okay, we got to get back to Texas, where at least they're uh, going to open up faster. You know, they still took a while. Some of the school public schools you hear um, still stayed shut down. Our, our kids went to a private school, and basically the headmaster there was like, look, we're not going to close down unless uh, the governor shuts us down. And so yep. I was like, okay, sign me, sign us up. Yep. <laughs> so, and, and you know, homeschool is kind of the same way. Like, I mean, I, so Brian, I went to a, a small private school from kindergarten to second grade, a public school from third grade to sixth grade, and then homeschool from seventh grade through 12th grade. So kind of got all of that in. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it's really up to the unique needs of each one of the, the mm -hmm. kids. I mean, you've yeah. got four kids, I've got three, you, you, each one learns so much differently. Mm -hmm. and, and, and putting them in this box called a public school, a government school, and thinking that they're all going to uh, learn the same way is just a ridiculous form mm -hmm. of education for us to be thinking that that's actually going to work and your schools will you know, even public schools will have some variety but yeah yeah overall rigid dogmatic and just not evidence-based you know i remember uh, you know so I, I homeschooled my older sons from grade seven on so mm. we were doing ap history tests since grade seven and eight yeah um, after middle school is over, my wife said they have to go back to regular school, and they tried that for three weeks. I go to their AP world history class at back to school night, told my wife we really ought to go see what's going on because yeah. I knew that was the best way to go and convince her to let them go back to homeschool. <laughs> but you have this AP world history teacher saying, now, here, uh, here in my class, I don't want to teach people like this. And when she did that, like, that's exactly how I believe you should teach. So, wow. <laughs> and I'm looking around the room, all the other parents are smiling and nodding. You know, like, look, I got <laughs> the, probably the, uh, the, let's see, I think my two students were probably the youngest kids in the entire country to pass the, the U.S. and European history APs. I think I know a lot better what I'm talking about than you do. But if I raised my hand and said that, I would just have tomatoes thrown at me. People right, yeah. want to hear what I had to say about it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Let's go on to the next topic then. So selfish reasons to have more kids. Speaking of kids, and mm -hmm. uh, you've got four, I've got three. And so we're doing our work in order to repopulate as much as possible. Um, Thank you for your service. Yeah, same to you. Same to you. Um, it, you know, it's it, it's not difficult every day, but I, I but I count my blessings at the same time. It's it's a, it's a beautiful thing to to raise them. But I, I I wonder from your perspective and um, why do you think that there's selfish reasons to have more kids? The impetus for this whole book is I have been reading about research on nature versus nurture for a long time. Yeah. Right. And you might think, how can anyone figure this out? It's just an impossible question. The two are inextricably intertwined. But then I discover, no, it's not. It's actually not so hopeless. There have been a lot of people who have been studying atypical families for uh, since around 1960. So what kind of atypical families? Well, families that adopt, where you can say, okay, now we can find an effect of nurture, even though there's no nature. We also look at families with twins, where you can compare identical fernal twins. And they reach some pretty striking conclusions, namely that, especially in the long run, nature is much more important than nurture. Nurture is really overrated. And I read this stuff, and then I had identical twins, and that really got me thinking. Because I'm like, oh wow, you're the kind of people people study when people want to find out why people are the way people why the why, why people are the way people are. I'll say yeah. it wasn't that they changed my mind, but it just really made me appreciate the significance of the evidence. So I looked around and I saw all these other parents who were stressing themselves out with helicopter parenting on the theory that the only way they can give their kids a good life is by making immense sacrifices. Mm. And I said, look, well, there's a lot of very good science on this that just says your, your theory is wrong. And it is a theory. You don't know that the key to uh, your child's success is parenting. You just think that you know mm. it. And what I say in this book is, first of all, 
learn the realities of what parents really are and are not able to change for their kids. Yeah. And then second, and then second, adjust your parenting style accordingly. If there's something that's fun, then great, keep doing it. But if there's something that hurts, that feels like a sacrifice, and then you learn it doesn't have a long run benefit, that's the kind of thing to stop. Mm-hmm. Now, to really answer your question and explain the title of the book, Selfish Reason to Have More Kids, say next step. Once you reduce the pain of having a kid by a lot, it is now time to consider whether you've chosen the right number of kids. Mm. And when the pain is lower, this is a reason to have more. So what I say is the scientific evidence is basically like a coupon for kids. It says kids 25% off, (laughs) 25% less money and time that you didn't want to spend for every kid. If you just don't like kids, then you can throw the coupon away. It won't change your behavior at all. It's like, here's a coupon for mayonnaise. I don't like mayonnaise, so it doesn't matter. But on the other hand, if you like the product, but it just seemed too expensive to you, this then is a reason to have more. And I will say out of all my work, the only thing I've ever written where I have any concrete sign that it's actually improved the world noticeably is that kid's book, because there really are hundreds of people who have said they've had additional kids because of that book. Yeah. As an economist, we're used to the idea, well, the value of life, one, one more person and being alive, that's like $10 million. So I'll say this book created billions of dollars of value, which is an incredible thought, even though I only got you know, 0.001% of those billions. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's great. And it's good to see some return, right? Out of all the time that you put into it, asking these big questions, uh, selfish mm-hmm. reason to have more kids. And was it, it, was there any particular reason why you wanted to stop at four? Was that, was that marginal cost ended up being too high? Hmm. That's a fair question. I mean, if it were totally up to me, I would have gone a lot further. But okay. The last pregnancy was really hard on my wife. And yeah. I wasn't going to get any further. Yeah. So. I hear you. We went through IVF uh, the last ah. couple that we had. And so um, that was all- that, that's that's pretty tough. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was, it was, it was a struggle there. Um, but, but, but that was one of the reasons why we stopped at three and we're, we're blessed. We have two boys and, and a, a little girl, mm-hmm. but at the same time, it's, you know, it can be a challenge, but, but you're right though. Mm-hmm. It, it, you need do need to find where your costs and benefits are and, mm-hmm. and, and how to reduce some of that. And we could talk about a, a lot more of these on each one of them, of course, but I wanted to hit some of the highlights that you have here uh, in the last few minutes that we have available open borders. That's another one that will trigger people. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, you, your name is, is, is brought up a lot in a lot of the circles and think tanks. And I work with a lot of the think tanks. And, and so I've had on Alex Narasta talking about, you know, uh, this, this issue and, and immigration. And of course, in Texas, it's, it's the talk of the town of the, the border yes. wall and what's happening between Governor Abbott and Biden and, and all this stuff that's happening. So I, I wonder with I wanted to get your perspective, though, on immigration and open borders, uh, things of that nature. Great. <laughs> start by saying that the typical pro-immigration person in America, what they say doesn't make a lot of sense. They just yeah. seem like bleeding hearts. And it's like, well, so what? We just like let everybody in and take care of them. I come for, to this from a totally different point of view. I don't come to it as immigration as a humanitarian thing where we just owe the world charity. Instead, I come, come from it from the question of well, what's going on with immigration hmm. so you, know, like, you just take a look and you see like someone comes from haiti they're shining shoes in the streets they move to the u.s and then suddenly they're making 10 times as much money as they were before and you just look at that and like hmm that's pretty amazing mm-hmm. it's like a person it's, it's the same person the person still only speaks french maybe and yet they just you just move them from port-au-prince to miami and a week later they're making 10 times as much money as they were before yeah. how is that even possible it really does seem like magic yeah Right. And you look into it a bit and you just apply basic labor economics and say, well, they must be making 10 times as much money in Miami than in Port-au-Prince because they're 10 times as productive. Mm. It's not like American employers are 10 times nicer than Haitian employers. They are paying people because they they know they can make money off of it. So it's like, right, they're 10 times as productive in the United States as they were back home. How could that be? Right. And this is one where you can go and look at agriculture and it's just obvious A Mexican farmer that gets moved to a U.S. farm is clearly growing way more food because he is part of a much more functional system. He's got the machinery and the management and the distribution. It's the same guy, but he can just accomplish a lot more agricultural production in the U.S. than he could back home. Hmm. Same thing with a factory. You can have very primitive production in a poor country, move that person to a rich country, and suddenly producing way more. Hmm. The only real puzzle is actually for services like shoe shining. 
It's like, well, he doesn't seem like he's doing anything different in America than he was doing in Haiti. It's like, right, well, you're missing the point. The real mm-hmm. function of any service is saving time. Yeah. In the United States, you are saving more valuable time, and that's the sense in which you're more productive. So you put all this together and you say, so it looks like when one immigrant moves from poor country, rich country, and I'm not talking about Sergey Brin or Albert Einstein, I'm talking about just a the humblest worker, a shoe shine boy, or a farmer. It looks like they are vastly more productive if you just go and stamp their stamp their papers and let them come in. Right. And that's this is where I think you would just have to be highly incurious to not look at that and say, can this be replicated? Can we do it mm-hmm. more? Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, could we do it for we can do it for one person? You can see that with your own eyes. I think you would just have to be completely blind to say, no, it isn't happening. Just look, look, we took this person. He was starving to death. And now he's got a job where he's sending money home and keeping relatives back in Haiti from starving to death. He did it with himself. He's just working. Like, you know, if it's an illegal worker, even more likely that all they're doing is working. They're too scared to go and get government benefits. Yeah. Right. So then the question is, right, could two people do it? Of course. Five. Yes. Ten. Yes. A hundred. Yes. A thousand. Yes. All right. Ten thousand. 100,000, a million. Right now, this is where a thoughtful person will start saying, well, if it's that many, then things are going to change. What I do in Open Borders is say that those are totally reasonable concerns. Let's talk about them. Let's not go and flip out at people and call them racist or horrible for for worrying that immigrants are going to go on welfare and be a burden on taxpayers or for worrying that there's going to be some cultural harm of the mess of our politics. Let's just look at the evidence and see, are the fears true? But furthermore, even if they are true, are they big? Mm. Are they big compared to these immense gains, which, of course, do not just go to the immigrant, they go to their customers. Mm. When When Afghan immigrants come and open up Afghan restaurants in the U.S., this isn't just something of concern to Afghans. This is something where everyone who eats at the restaurant is actually getting that. Our go-to restaurant here in Fairfax is an Afghan restaurant. My friend Daoud runs it. But he escaped from Afghanistan like mm. four years ago. And so like this guy is doing so much more for the world than he would have been if he'd just been stuck back home. What and then what is it like? What's the downside? Yeah. So this is this is honestly where I come from as an economist. Just starts with looking at the world and seeing that obviously it sure looks great to let one immigrant in. And then could the appearances be deceiving? Mm. I know all in the background of all this is the idea that it's good for people to work and produce stuff and contribute to society. If you look at another human being and you just see a parasite, mm. that's what I'll say. Look. It, like, it could be that way if your system is highly dysfunctional, if you have a law saying that refugees get supported by taxpayers for life and aren't legally allowed to work, then yeah, they're, it's going to look like they're parasites. But is that not that the fault of your crummy system rather than the actual immigrant themselves? I like to contrast the approach to immigration of Sweden with the Gulf monarchies. Mm. In Sweden, you know, these are countries where they have very big welfare states. They give a lot of money to anyone they let in. And I think also... There are wait times before they can even start working. Mm. And then they pat themselves on the back. We have the wheel. We are so wonderful. Everyone should go and think of us as their moral superiors. You know, on the other hand, you have Gulf monarchies where people just come to work. There's, they basically won't share the oil money with them. But guess what? The Gulf monarchies let in a ton of people mm. because they correctly realize that human beings are capable of adding value to the world, and you don't have to be a genius to do it. Yeah. The humblest worker can still contribute, and in a functional society, you're happy to see it happen because it's way better than nothing. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And I think there's so many good points about that is that we often look at the seen versus the unseen, right? Mm-hmm. Th- that's mm-hmm. a big part of this with immigration. We want to blame others for mm-hmm. our problems instead of like what I usually say, Brian, is that we have one finger pointed at whoever it is, but we have three more pointing back at us. That we, <laughs> we, we need to do more for mm-hmm. ourselves and thinking about our own system that we have problems mm-hmm. with instead of blaming others for mm-hmm. these problems, whether it's um, immigration or trade. Uh, there's so many different things that's happening that's our our own issues that mm-hmm. we need to deal with versus blaming someone else for those problems. And as you know, in Texas, there you have this policy of busing migrants up to New York. And then New Yorkers saying, we can't handle it because we got a law saying that we got to go and give them a pile of benefits. Like, Hmm. well, who thought that? Yep. Well, the last thing here I want to talk to you about real quick, Brian, is um, you have a new book coming out. Yes. Is it still April, 2024? Let's see. Ah, So actually I've got a new book that's just out and then there is, there's the one. So the book that is just out is a collection of essays called You Will Not Stampede Me, Essays on Nonconformism. 
uh, a subject about which I think I know quite a bit because I've been a nonconformist for a long time. Yeah. I think the one that you're asking about is actually Build Baby Build, yes. the Science Ethics Housing Regulation. So the actual release date is now May 1st. So May 1st. One day, out, one day out of April, but okay. essentially, yes, coming out then. Uh, this is another nonfiction graphic novel where I'm taking a lot of research that I think is of intrinsic immense importance, but it's just too boring for most people to read. <laughs> Yeah, And I try to go and put it into this graphic novel format so that people actually want to read it. Yeah, um, I've, I mean, as, so as an academic educator, I am very conscious of how there's fantastic research that nobody reads because it's too boring. So how can I make it less boring? Uh, my solution anyway has been to write these graphic novels, which I think actually have two benefits. One, you really can say more per minute mm. because picture is worth a thousand words if you choose it well. But on top of that, by making people feel happy and engaged and getting them to laugh, I try to make it funny, even though I'm trying to educate at the same time, you get people to give you more minutes of their time. So give me more learning per minute times more minutes of your time. And I think I can teach you a lot more. Nice. That's what, I, what, that's what I'm going for. Uh, I'm super happy with how the book uh, has turned out. It took longer than I was hoping, but yeah. that's the final product. I'm looking at it going, all right, this looks great. Nice, nice. Well, that's certainly a topic that we need more information on. So I hope more people will read it. And it is B Build Baby Build, the Science yes. and Ethics of Housing Regulation. And we we, we know that housing is uh, becoming unaffordable. And most people want to blame it for this, that, and another. But a lot of it has to do with regulations and zoning yeah. and back In to fact, government over, being the problem. Over, over, overwhelmingly regulation. Yeah. Back when regulation was light, there was a very simple way that housing markets worked, which is that if the, co if the price of housing exceeds its cost of production, Builders would start building a lot more housing, which would bring down the price until it was back down at the cost of production. Mm. Starting around 1970, things started diverging because it's just so hard to get the right papers. Mm. There are so many restrictions on how much land you have to use and whether you can do multifamily and the height of building and historic preservation, on and on. The mix varies a lot from place to place, but the bottom line is we treat developers like criminals, mm. even though they provide our second most important product. Yeah. First most important one is food. Imagine if we've been strangling the food industry for the last 50 years and acting as like acting as if anyone under wanted to grow food was a criminal. Yeah, we'd be seeing, wow, it's really hard to afford food. Right? Same thing with housing. Like builders would love to go and build a pile of housing. Mm -hmm. If you just take a look at almost any plot of land in America and in, in an area with reasonably high prices and say, couldn't they have built more there? The answer is totally technologically. It was feasible. They wanted to do it, but the government wouldn't let them. Yep. Yep. That's exactly right. Well, I, I look forward to reading it and I'll make sure to share it and everything else. And it's really been a pleasure to have you on Brian and, and thank you for being on the Life People Prosper show and God bless you and your family. And I, I hope that um, we'll have more time to talk again soon. Yeah, that was fantastic being here. And if anyone wants to learn more, so yes. all of my books are on Amazon. Uh, my latest book, uh, You Will Not Stampede Me, Essays on Nonconformism is only 12 bucks or $9.99 with ebook. And then I also have a subset called Bet On It. Yes. Exactly right. Well, I'll put those in the show notes as well. Um, so we'll have that. So um, thanks again. And for the audience, please leave us a five-star rating and review it and share it with your friends and family, if you will. And until next time, let people prosper.